this is the question we're going to cover in this talk. Is AI replacing software engineering? You know, I'm going to show you a lot of data, a lot of charts. I'm going to try to define what this question even means in the first place. So we'll get started. First of all, the first piece of tech that will come to a lot of people's minds when I ask this question is called Devon. Devon, they claim to be the first AI software engineer and the claim is highly you know, arguable and debatable, but at least on this particular data set called Sweetbench, that's a data set of real world software engineering issues on open source Python projects, they were able to show that their fully autonomous AI software engineering system was able to solve about 14% of those GitHub issues. And then later on, this other one called Factory Code Droid came about and they say they were able to solve about 19% of those issues. This other one called Ader said they were able to solve about 19% of those issues as well. And when you look at these numbers, you might say that looks pretty impressive and it is. But there are a couple things to keep in mind. One is that they're not necessarily random 19% of those issues, not completely random, they're more likely to be on the easier side of the issues, both for humans and AI. And then the other thing is, this doesn't say anything about the quality of the PRs and the contributions. It just says that they were able to pass the tests, and that's pretty much it. But still, you might say, you know, with this strong kind of improvement, is AI replacing software engineering? The way I like to personally think about it is kind of like self-driving. You know, if a company came about and said, we developed a self-driving system that's able to drive autonomously on 20% of all public roads, I would say, okay, that's, that's pretty impressive. But that's not quite as good as it would need to be to be able to replace driving completely in that particular analogy. And same thing with software engineering. And the fundamental problem to me is that AI, the way it's currently developed, it doesn't think like a human does. You know, it is really intelligent at certain tasks. It is able to solve certain types of tasks. But it doesn't have the same logical thinking capabilities that humans do. It doesn't always know what we want. It doesn't have a desire like people do. So it's fundamentally different. And that's really where you know, we need to come in as humans and kind of work with AI to get the results we want. And I wanted to show you a concrete example of that here. And that is this event I'm hosting in San Francisco in a few days. I'm actually you know, flying out there uh, tomorrow for that. It's called AI DevTools Night. And for this event, I asked a few questions during the registration process. I said, how did you hear about this meetup? And would you like a chance to try this open source coding assistant, source graph coding? And I wanted to use AI to analyze these responses. Basically, I wanted to use AI to write Python to visualize these responses. So I went ahead and downloaded a CSV version of the survey responses. And then I cleaned it up. I anonymized, of course, very important. And then I uploaded it to ChatGPT. And I said, can you make charts out of these survey responses? And the result I got looked like this. <laughs> So it might be kind of hard to see, but on the right, it's not too bad. It is showing a graph of you know, how many people said yes versus how many people said no. But on the left, what it's doing is it's trying to categorize each slightly different response to this free form text question as a different category. But that's not what it should do. You know, what it really should do is it should kind of manually inspect all the responses and then categorize them sort of manually using Python. But it didn't know to do that. Like I said, AI sometimes doesn't know what we want as people. So that's where I needed to come in and 
go back to the beginning of the conversation, and I needed to kind of go step by step. I needed to first ask, do you understand this data in the first place? You know, yes or no, and I needed to give it the same data in a textual format. You know, it's the same CSV data, but I needed to copy and paste it in a textual format. And then after that, I needed to ask it to make pie charts out of these, you know, while grouping similar categories and ignoring non-responses, and I needed to give it a lot of details like that. And then on top of all of that, I needed to upload the CSV file again, and then I needed to say, remember this, this data is the same as the textual format data I gave you? You just need to you know, define the categorization and grouping with Python. So I needed to go through a lot of work. You know, it, it took me a significant amount of work to go through that. And then finally, I was able to get it to produce Python code that produced satisfying results. So here, you might ask, did AI replace software engineering or coding, whatever you want to call this particular no example? And in a way, it did, because I didn't have to write the underlying Python code. You know, AI did it for me. But at the same time, I needed to go in as a human software engineer you know, with some knowledge of Python, data visualization, uh, the survey structure, and all of that to kind of instruct it to do exactly what I wanted. You know, I needed to really work with it. So AI, as it currently stands, it's not ready to replace software engineering on its own completely. But we are moving more into this world where line by line coding matters less. And you know, coding by chat or you know, coding with AI matters more. You know, we need to work with AI. And some people call that chat-oriented programming, or CHOP for short. So to me, a more relevant question here is, is AI replacing software engineering jobs? And I like to put this question in perspective by visualizing it this way. So in this chart, the area above the line represents the number of software engineer's jobs that are available in that particular year. And the area inside the circle represents the number of software engineers that are available, let's say, in the world. And as you probably know, in 2020, 2021, you know, the market was much better for software engineers, more software engineer jobs. So it was much easier for a typical software engineer to get a job, keep a job, and get a raise. But this year, you know, it's much harder, fewer software engineer jobs, and it's hard for a typical engineer to do all of those three things. And the question you might ask here is, in a few years, is it going to look like this, where the market is even harder? Or is it going to look like this, where the market is slightly easier with more software engineering jobs? This is a tough question to answer, partly because AI is not the only factor that goes into this. You know, it's only one of the factors, and it's probably not even the main factor, in my opinion. One of the main factors that goes into it is actually the interest rate. So for the past few years, the interest rate has gone up. And at the same time, the number of software engineering jobs has gone down. So there's a you know, seemingly strongly strong correlation there. But you might say, OK, what is AI's effect? in particular on jobs, though. There are kind of two sides to this argument. One side says each software engineer is going to be more productive, you know, from what I've seen, 20 to 30% more productive. And therefore, we'll need fewer software engineers. But the other side says the cost of creating software is going to go down because of AI. And therefore, more software will be created because you know, when something's cost goes, goes down, more of it will be created in general. And for that reason, you know, there will be more software engineering jobs. And there is a merit to both of these arguments. It's impossible to know for anyone you know, which side is going to win out over the long term. But I'm personally slightly more optimistic towards more software jobs being created over the long term.
And if you look at the present and the you know, immediate future, there are a couple of positive signs as well. So this one is from May of this year that shows there were sort of a record number, 12 month high number of who is hiring postings on Hacker News in particular. And then this one is a news article that says 81% of hiring managers are optimistic about hiring plans for the rest of the year. So when you combine all of these different factors, facts on the ground, you know, different stories, what people are experiencing, plus potential effects of AI, my best educated guess is that in a few years, the market is going to be slightly better. There will be more software engineer jobs. That's my best prediction. You know, I could be wrong, but that's where I am with this. And this is a question I get a lot, so I need to address this. Should I go into software engineering? If someone had asked me, should I go into software engineering just to make money in 2016, I would have said yes. I mean, it's, it's a nice way to make money, just do that. But this year, I would say be careful about it. And part of the reason is because it's been a tough market for juniors in particular. So this is a graph that shows the number of jobs for different levels on Hacker News again. And if you look at the blue lines for juniors, both in absolute numbers and percentages, the number of jobs for juniors has been going down over the past few years. And I think juniors themselves you know, understand this dynamic to some extent. If you look at Stack Overflow 2024 survey, you, know, you find this question, are AI tools a threat to your job? And people who were learning to code were more likely to say, yes, are they, they are a threat to my job than professional developers. At the same time, you know, this is still a good industry, in my opinion, if you're like really passionate about it, whatever it is, right? Like not necessarily software engineering, you know, whether it's QA or design or whatever that might be. If you're passionate about it, if you want to make a lot of contribution to it, if you feel like you can be one of the best, then definitely go for it. I would encourage it. But if not, be careful, you know, think about it carefully. And the final question I'm going to try to address in this talk is what can I do as an individual if I already decided to go into the industry or if I'm already in the industry, some of you are you know, maybe in that spot. In that case, I have three pieces of advice that I recommend. The first one is to be familiar with different models that are available in the market, you know, different large language models currently, and understand you know, to some extent, you don't have to be an expert, but you want to understand to some extent what they're good at, which ones are you know, better than uh, which other ones, roughly speaking. Currently, you know, if you look at this uh, popular leaderboard, LMSYS.org, you see that Gemini 1.5 Pro is the most advanced model according to their metrics. But that's for the overall category. If you look at the coding category, you find that Cloud 3.5 Sonnet is the most advanced model according to their metrics. And it has been regarded as the most advanced model for coding in general as well. So I would say learn about you know, these different models, what they're good at, and basically find a tool that fits your job. The second piece of advice I would give is learn effective prompting. I think the example I gave earlier is a good example of that. It comes down to three things in my opinion. You want to make your intention really, really clear. You want to make your context clear and provide as much context as possible, maybe a lot of copy and pasting. And then you want to provide a lot of details in your prompt. And combining all of these, if that's not even enough, then you might need to go through a lot of trial and error to see what works, whether it's back and forth conversations or you know, trying out different prompts. And then the third thing I would keep in mind is that there are different types of dev tools that you can use as a software engineer or a coder in general. You know, we started with really, you know, auto completion, code completion systems, you know, kind of like Copilot. We moved on to, you know, chat systems, ChatGPT, other ones, Claude, more advanced chat systems. And then we also now have AI coding agents. I think the way I like to see is that, you know, part of your job as a software engineer has always been to, you know, 
understand what's in your tool set. You know, is it Google? Is it your code editor? Is it something else? Is it Stack Overflow? Those tools have always been in your tool set. What's changed with AI is simply that you have more tools in your tool set. You know, not any single one of these tools is going to replace all the other ones. Like, you know, AI coding agents are not going to replace the chat systems completely, and chat systems are not going to replace the autocomplete systems completely. So you want to understand that there are different tools available in your tool set now, additional tools. And as it's always been the job, as part of your job as a software engineer, you want to learn to use the right tool for the right job for, at the right time. I hope that makes sense. And I have to say, one tool and company that's been working on all of these surface areas actively is called SourceGraph Cody. It's the company I work at now, you know, full, full disclosure. And I even gave a talk about it in San Francisco last time I was there. So feel free to check it. And thank you so much, everyone. <laughs>